A quiet start to an otherwise very busy week. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equity futures totally unchanged. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, a key earnings test for struggling regional banks. Secretary Yellen remains cautiously optimistic and top G7 diplomats meeting over in Japan. We begin with the big issue, a port in the storm. We saw some of the first banks report, some of the larger banks. The large banks had a great quarter. We're looking at mega banks. I had to double check my numbers. Very, very good. Because the revenue beat is amazing. You've had, you know, the benefit of interest rates moving up. Things have started to look a little bit better than some analysts expect. These numbers are much better than where the stocks were trading. I don't think we're completely out of the woods yet. There's a big difference between what's happening with regional banks and what's going to happen with the major national banks. We'll hear much more um, from some of those smaller uh, mid-sized banks this week. The regional banks will be critical. What happened on Friday was JP Morgan and, and others came out and said, you know, we're not in the middle of a credit crisis. If you're a strong bank, you could withstand what's coming. The big banks are just fine. Let's start a conversation this week. Joining us now is Invesco's Brian Levitt and Cameron Dawson of New Edge Wealth. Cameron, I want to come to you on this. Have the big banks signaled the all clear? Or have we just learned that the big banks can demonstrate their report in the storm? I think it's more of the latter, and it also demonstrates that usually banks are late cycle, meaning that higher interest rates are great for banks as long as they're not having credit issues, as long as they're not having deposit issues. And it's one of the reasons why we saw loan growth actually accelerate last year, despite the fact that senior loan officer surveys said that conditions were tightening and despite the fact that rates were going up. So we don't think that just because the strongest, most regulated, most stable banks are really able to, to say that the small banks will have no issues going on with them. So we think that it's likely more of a tale of two cities or a very bifurcated market. Brian Levitt, do you agree? I do agree. But it, before we get too negative, um, when you think about the, the smaller banks, um, we've seen a pretty big move in interest rates down. So, so that certainly helps any of those banks that were offsides with regards to rate risk. We've also seen the Fed and, and the FDIC with a very strong response. So while there's going to be tightening of, of credit conditions and perhaps, uh, you know, another shoe or two to drop where the policymakers have to respond, I think investors can be comforted by the fact that this is not going to likely cascade throughout the global financial system. And, um, you know, this is, this is just something that is another leg of a, of a late cycle where we're going to see tighter lending standards on, on top of significant policy tightening. That slows the economy down. But in many ways, the, uh, you know, the equity market has been largely aware of that for over a year now. Just amazing numbers from some of the major lenders here stateside on Friday. JP Morgan, net interest income up more than 40%. Wells Fargo up more than 40%. Net interest income over at City up more than 20%. Cameron, when you look at the banking stress of the last month, are you seeing clear enough signs that things have at least stabilised over the last couple of weeks? It certainly seems that way because we've even seen deposits stabilise for the smaller banks in the last week. So we saw deposits tick up just slightly. We've also seen loan growth tick up just slightly. So at this point, it, looked like, it looks like the issues are contained. However, we still have to watch credit growth really, really closely. That is the thing that could tip us into a recession if it were to slow meaningfully. And the question is, was SVB or the failure of Signature Bank enough to get credit growth to go from the double-digit pace where it was last year to something much lower? If that's the case, then certainly we would have more economic issues on the horizon. But at this point, we simply don't have enough data to judge that. Some important dates we need to look at from Thursday and on Friday as well to start this week. Let's go down to Washington, D.C. and catch up with Kaylee Lines. Hey, Kaylee. Hey, John. Well, it's interesting to see a bit of a mixed picture for the banks here this morning. After earlier gains, you now have the regional bank ETF down in pre-market trading by about a quarter of 1%. Though there are some names like M&T that are gaining after what broadly was pretty good earnings, though they did come up just light on deposits. 
Broadly, though, as you allude to on the subject of deposits, it does seem like things are getting better based on the data we got last week. Remember, we had a 22 percent drop in bank deposits in March. But in the week through April 5th, they started to pick back up at both large and small banks. Deposits climbing nearly $61 billion in total. And at smaller banks, they rose by the most this year. And lending is picking up as well, something you three were just alluding to. Commercial bank lending did increase by $10.2 billion in the week ended April 5th, according to the Fed's data. And this does suggest that credit conditions are starting to stabilize. The liquidity conditions uh, also perhaps stabilizing as well. If you look at bank borrowing activity, they have reduced their lending uh, borrowing from the Federal Reserve backstop facilities for a fourth week in a row. Combined, U.S. banks had about $139.5 billion in outstanding borrowings from the Fed. That is down from the previous week. And when you look at the traditional backstop, in particular the discount window, that was at $67.6 billion in outstanding borrowing. That is well down from the record of nearly $153 billion we saw last month at the height of the banking turmoil. John. Thank Katie, thanks for that. Some stability in the data from last week. This raises a really important question. Does the data matter? And when we talk about the economic data, what data are we talking about? The data that Katie just went over from Thursday from the Federal Reserve, from Friday from the Federal Reserve, or traditional indicators, CPI, payrolls, GDP, all of the above. Ellen Zetner of Morgan Stanley has this to say. The data matter only insofar as banking pressures are stable and credit conditions remain healthy. So against the backdrop of relative stability in a financial system, we believe the employment and inflation data in hand will lead the Fed to deliver a final 25 basis point hike. That's the view from Morgan Stanley. This is the view from Citi and Andrew Hollenhorst. The banking stress of one month ago has stabilized rapidly and looks more idiosyncratic than systemic. Banks are sourcing less emergency liquidity from the Fed. After multiple weeks of stability, macro markets are likely to shift focus away from bank data and back towards standard macroeconomic indicators. Now, Brian Levitt, over to you, sir. Do you think it's time to shift away from bank data and get back to focusing on traditional macroeconomic indicators? Well, I would consider bank data as part of traditional macroeconomic indicators. So when I think of the guideposts on a path to recession, the way these things usually play out is the Fed raises rates to control inflation, growth slows, and banks tighten lending standards. I mean, that's, that's how these things play out. And the banks were tightening lending standards even before um, we were focusing on Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. So, yeah, those were disconcerting moments within a tightening cycle, but those moments always happen. I mean, can we think of a tightening cycle environment that didn't end with some type of accident somewhere? What's critical for investors is they didn't all become 2008. You could think of 1984 with Continental Illinois. You could think about the early 90s, late 80s with the savings and loan crisis. So I would say that this is just another guidepost on the way to how cycles end. Now, for investors, um, are you focused on you know, the next handful of weeks in which the economy may slow down more and you could retrace some of the recent gains? Or are you focused on the next couple of years? Because in an environment that um, in the couple of years after inflation peaks and a couple of years after the Fed is done raising rates, markets tend to do very well. Well, this conversation around banking, though, Cameron, has massive implications for how far the Fed will ultimately go. We've got a market pricing in cuts. Before the banking stress, it was having a look, at least having a look, at the idea that maybe we take rates to 6%. The one question we've tried to answer over the last month, Cameron, I'm not sure we've answered it just yet, is to what extent the stress of the last month is a substitute for rate hikes from the Federal Reserve. The market's repriced aggressively. Cameron, how should it reprice now? Well, again, it all depends on loan growth. If we don't see loan growth slow, then I don't think that there will be a big mechanism that this banking issue will have an impact on the broader economy, which would just mean that those aggressive rate cuts that are priced in, and those have been pushed back a little bit as we've seen some of the stronger data and some of the stability, but that the bond market is yet again ahead of itself, cutting pricing in those interest rate cuts into the back half of this year. So what that could speak to is more continued volatility within interest rates within the bond market as yet again the bond market got ahead in pricing in a pivot. Well, yields up again this morning by seven basis points, just short of 420 on a two-year. Big move on Friday off the back of those comments from Governor Waller. Very hawkish stuff. We'll touch on that a little bit later in the program. But there seems to be some tension right now, Cameron, between what we're pricing for the Fed, cuts, where CPI is around 5%. And where the S&P 500 is trading in and around 4,200, can those three things, 
coexist. The S&P, north of 4K, CPI, around 5%, and pricing in all these rate cuts. What gives here? The equity market wants to have its cake and eat it too. It's taking the bond market's message of a recession, putting downward pressure on rates, and saying, great, we'll give a big multiple to equities. Equities are now trading at nearly 19 times. That's a standard deviation above average near prior peaks pre-pandemic. So equities are taking lower rates with the recession risk, giving it to the multiple. But then on the earnings front, not pricing in a recession into the earnings line. Flat earnings this year simply reflect a normalization of margins off of the pandemic era. Recession. If we were to have a recession, you're likely looking at something like more like 10% down closer to 200, which of course makes valuations even more stretched. So it really comes down to the earnings line, the onus on earnings to deliver a rebound, which is baked into the back half of this year, really to see equities move much higher given that valuations are already very stretched. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley, super bearish on earnings, as many of you watching this program know, kicks off the trading week with this new note, with the fastest Fed policy shift in 40 years. We think more negative surprises lie ahead for investors. One that we think is in plain sight is earnings forecasts that remain too optimistic. Now, Brian, when I listen to you, you sound a little bit more constructive than most. Do you disagree with Mike Wilson or are you just taking a longer time horizon here? Well, I, I think we should remember that the markets lead the economy, not vice versa. So there was an S&P 500 that had bottomed at around 3,600. And so to me, that was a, a taking down peak earnings about 20 percent and multiples rising in a lower interest rate environment. So, you know, in many ways, we've, we've already done this. The question now is what's the market looking ahead to next? Is the market looking ahead to a new policy environment? That's how new cycles start. So I don't want to be too Pollyanna and say that we may not retrace some of these recent gains. You might. I mean, if, if the market has to, if the market thinks the Fed's going to go more now, then yeah, you're going to retrace some of these recent gains. But I think most investors aren't that tactical. This is how new cycles start. And, you know, if you have a fear of missing out on it, then you want to be starting to think about what does it mean as you shift more defensively towards, towards what is going to be a recovery over the next um, couple of years in the economy and the market. Brian, are you suggesting to us that we priced the recession back in October that we still haven't had yet? Yeah, it seems like it, right? I mean, the, you know, the, the market went to 3,600 down from, you know, close to 5,000. I mean, that's a 25.4% decline peak to trough that we had in the market. It, the declines associated with average recessions is around 31%. So that's 80% of the way there. Now, as you know, as everyone knows, averages lie. Some of that 31% includes years like 08, 01, 1973, when the markets went down 50 to 60%, and it took you six, seven, eight years to recover. Does it feel like those types of environments, or is it more similar to an 81 or a 91, where the markets fell 20, 25%, and you recovered within a couple of years? I think 81 is a very good example because inflation peaked in March of 1980. The Federal Reserve raised rates through the end of the year. You did get a recession the following year and you got volatility ahead of that recession. But if you had invested when inflation peaked or you had invested when the Fed stopped raising interest rates, you were very happy over the next few years. So again, time horizon is going to matter if you're worried about you know, the next few weeks or you're worried about if the Fed has to raise another quarter point, then yeah, you'd want to be a little bit more defensive in here. But if you're focusing out over what tends to happen as new cycles emerge, well, then you should be thinking, um, you know, longer term, the market, I think the market's bottom. You know, that's, we've already done that 25.4%. That's the constructive view right now, Cameron. I want to squeeze in just a final word from you. How rare would it be to price in a low ahead of a recession we still haven't seen yet and a low that was almost six months ago. Yeah, we've talked a lot about the yield curve and the pricing in of recessions and that, and that you typically don't see risk assets bottomed until you've seen a re-steepening of the yield curve, until we've actually seen the recession, the whites of its eyes, and you've seen the earnings move lower. We think that the 2022 move was all based on valuation and really valuations coming down from a bubble level that was the result of unprecedented policy support from the Fed and fiscal policy. So the fact that we moved down 
down so much was simply because of valuations being so high going into 22. So that's when you roll forward and say, now it's less about the valuation line having more downside. It's more about the growth line. But now, of course, we've seen valuations move up again. So we think they've returned as a risk to this market simply because they're extended versus history. Cameron, Brian, you're going to be well, sticking with us. Brian, you're going to jump in in about three minutes. I'm going to go to a commercial break in a moment. Then you can jump back in and weigh in. Your equity market unchanged on the S&P 500. Let's get you some movers. Here's Abby. Good morning, John. And a real tug of war beneath that benign surface, starting out with one of the morning's big laggards, Alphabet Google. These shares are dropping. In fact, heading to the worst day since early February when the company had that AI problem. Samsung may choose Bing, according to one report, for its default search engine on its devices. This could put $3 billion in search engine sales at risk. Turning to a gainer, however, Tesla. Renault readies its EV price cuts in Europe on Tesla the pressure, which of course has been uh, reducing sticker prices, though shares up modestly. M&T Bank, as Kelly was pointing out earlier, higher on a largely solid quarter where they beat and they also grew revenue and earnings. Deposits a little light. Speaking of deposits, John, Schwab down 3%. Their deposits tumbled 30% in the first quarter. That's causing the company to pause its buybacks on what it's now calling regulatory uncertainty. Again, shares of Schwab down on that report of that uh, those deposits dropping 30%. Abby, thanks for that. Your broader equity market unchanged coming up. Secretary Yellen sounding cautiously optimistic. The outlook remains one for um, moderate growth and continued strong labor market with inflation coming down. A conversation up next. I'm not seeing anything at this time that is dramatic enough or significant enough, in my view, to significantly change the outlook. The outlook remains one for um, moderate growth and continued strong labor market with inflation coming down. Secretary Yellen sticking to the script and to her outlook. This coming after the Fed doubled down on their own message, the job's not done yet. That's the line from Fed Governor Chris Waller. Monetary policy will need to remain tight for a substantial period of time and much longer than markets are currently anticipating. I would welcome any signs of moderating demand, but until they appear, and I see inflation moving meaningfully and persistently down toward our 2% target, I believe there is still work to do. Mike McKay, there's still work to do. Well, we know that, and the expectation is we're going to get a quarter point rise on May 3rd, unless we get some sort of strange data between now and then. I think what's happening now is we're evolving into a discussion of do they go beyond that or do they not? Now, coming up this week, we've got a lot of Fed speak to parse through, although not everything is worth listening to. Uh, Beige Book. Goolsby and Williams on Wednesday, Mester on Thursday, along with Bostic and Harker. Those are the ones talking about the economy. So that's what you want to watch, uh, those uh, right there. Mike, is that it? Is that the Fed speak and the outlook for the economy? Some data coming up through the week as well. Look out for that too. Mike's going to break that down. We'll get a final word with Cameron Dawson, Brian Levitt. They join us right now. Brian, you wanted to jump in, sir. Please jump in. Yeah, my point was just to say that when we had the valuation adjustment last year, but you know, if you think about how these things play out, I mean, earnings were going to peak around 220 in an average recession, you go down 20 percent. So that's 180 on earnings. And you assume as rates come down, multiples go up. So you put a 20 time multiple on 180 earnings, you're at or 3,600. So that's, you know, that's how you contemplate that being the bottom. Now, if the idea is that inflation's not over and rates have to go up a lot more, then yeah, valuations have to adjust. Um, in my mind, inflation is coming down. It's going to come down more rapidly than people think. And and I think the Fed should have been done, um, you know, a couple of rate hikes ago. We'll we'll see where they go. But we've already had an awful lot of tightening plus uh, lending conditions tightening. Cameron, what about you? 
Well, I think it remains to be seen if we've actually had an awful amount of tightening based on market pricing, because if you look at Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, it's now back to easing territory. We've retraced over three quarters of the tightening that happened in the wake of SVB. And that index is now back to levels where we've seen the Fed really push back against market pricing. So it's back to the levels that we saw before Jackson Hole, February of this year. And that's been points where the Fed has turned very, very hawkish and really talked markets into pricing in higher interest rates. Now, the question is, has inflation moved down enough that some of the urgency around that hawkish talk is removed? If you base it on Waller's comments from Friday, that doesn't seem to be the case. And it seems like they're looking at some of those more sticky, sustained components of inflation, like sticky CPI, which have yet to roll over meaningfully, even after you remove the shelter component, which just says that the Fed is concerned that inflation will stay higher for longer, which is why they think that they need to stay higher for longer. We're going to talk about that divide between the market and this Fed for a long, long time until it's resolved. Cameron Dawson, Brian Levitt to the two of you, thank you. Your equity market just about unchanged on the S&P 500. We were due to see a SpaceX launch round about now. Ed Ludlow has been following this story for us. Ed, I'm told it's not happening. What's going on? Yeah, Starship will not launch this morning, John. It is a scrub. There was a pressurant valve issue that was frozen in the super heavy booster. So they're not going to take the risk. There's eight million pounds of propellant, methane and oxygen oxidizer. The, the worry is that a catastrophic failure and explosion could damage the launch pad. Must set the expectations very low for this. It's not a surprise. Earliest Wednesday. We'll try again, John, out of Boca Chica, Texas. Looking forward to the conversation. Ed, I know you and I are going to touch base again in about 10 minutes anyway to talk about some tech names. So we'll do that in just a moment. The broader market just about unchanged on the S&P 500. Coming up in the morning calls and later, bracing for impact. Why BNP's Calvin C thinks the economy is headed for recession. That conversation just around the corner. Five minutes away from the opening bell, equities down about a tenth of one percent on the S&P and the Nasdaq down about a tenth of one percent also. That's the price action. Let's get you some morning calls. Piper Sandler upgrading Biogen to overweight, pointing to a number of positive catalysts on the horizon. That stock is up by 1.5 percent. Mizuo downgrading ConocoPhillips to neutral, seeing more attractive opportunities elsewhere after the company's analyst day. That stock's down about one percent. And finally, New Street Research downgrading meta platforms to neutral, expecting further upside to be limited with the outlook for margins remaining uncertain. That stock is down by about nine tenths of 1%. Coming up, another busy week of bank earnings on deck. That conversation up next with BNP's Calvin C around the opening bell. Your opening bell up next with equity futures down about a tenth of 1%. Three seconds away from the opening bound in New York to kick off a brand new, fresh trading week with equity futures totally unchanged on the S&P 500 after a marginal week of gains on the S&P of about eight tenths of one percent or so off the back of pretty tremendous bank earnings on Wall Street. More bank earnings through the week. Let's see opening bow, switch on the board and get to the bond market. Here's a move for you. Yields higher again. 356 on a 10-year up five basis points, up more so at the front end of the curve on a two-year yield off the back of Governor Wallace's comments on Fridays. Yields up, up and away. And this morning, some follow-through. Up five basis points on a two-year to 415. That means some dollar strength, euro dollar back and away, negative four tenths of one percent after seeing a new intraday high for the year on Euro dollar on Friday. The euro stronger at one. 1076. We've backed away since then. Crude back and away as well. A break of 82. 82 right now. We're down about six tenths of 1% on WTI. That's the broader price action, the broader story in the equity market. The open and bell about 30 seconds into the session. We are negative by not even a tenth of 1% on the S&P. One stock to watch at the open, M&T Bank, reporting better than expected Q1 results and net interest income doubling over the past year. Katie Lines has more. Hey, Katie. 
Yeah, John, interesting to see that M&T Bank actually now down a few tenths of a percent at the opening bell after earlier in free market trading being up nearly 5 percent. So quite the turnaround here. As you said, broadly, it was a beat on most metrics. They beat on revenue, net interest income, uh, as you said, helped a better than expected profit with earnings per share coming in at four dollars and one cent. The average analyst estimate was for 397. Where they came up short, though, is important because it's the metric we have all been watching. Total deposits down 2.7 percent quarter on quarter to 159 billion dollars. The street was looking for 161 billion dollars. Also noteworthy, provisions for credit losses were higher than anticipated at 120 million dollars. The bank saying that reflects weaker conditions on several loan types. So that could be contributing to the fading optimism we are seeing here, perhaps not giving much relief to a stock that is down 20 percent year to date and down more than 27 uh, percent over the last 12 months. It'll be interesting to see what kind of color comes out of the headlines on the earnings call, which begins at 11 a.m. Eastern. But of course, this in some ways setting the tone for the other regional banks that have yet to report. We have Western Alliance due tomorrow, U.S. Bank on Thursday, and the next week, the ones I'll really be watching, First Republic, as well as Pac West, which of course was downgraded to junk by Fitch on Friday because of concern around deposit outflows. John. First Republic a week from today. Katie, thanks for that. Those names have been hammered. This name as well. Charles Schwab shares under pressure as they announce plans to pause their buyback program. Shanali Basak has more. Hey, Shanali. Hey, John. Listen, you have a deposit base that is down about 30 percent over at Schwab. And while that's about in line with expectations, you also have Schwab halting share buybacks. Now, listen, the market is already reacting to the stock, and some of the numbers were actually above expectations. The good news within the results here is that net interest income was above expectations. Net new client assets were above expectations. But again, that deposit number is a big deal because because that is what lowers the cost of funding. UBS is saying that the cost of funding, the wholesale funding here, comes in above their estimate, but not as ugly as feared. Remember, it's too early to say whether this industry is completely out of the woods, although there are some things within Schwab's numbers that show some green shoots. With that said, the pausing the buybacks is something that comes after pretty historic levels of buybacks for a company like this. So the question about profitability becomes a perennial issue for Schwab as we see some certain business lines, certainly under pressure here at the company. Shanali, you and I are going to talk about the big names tomorrow, no doubt. Bank of America, Goldman, Tuesday, on to Wednesday. We're going to be talking about the obvious names as well, like Morgan Stanley. Then there's the regional banks, which Katie Lines went over. Out of all these names, Shanali, traditionally we just talk about the big ones. What are you focused on this week? Just check out what a messy week we're looking at ahead of us. Until First Republic on Monday, you can't say the industry is out of the woods because of the big existential questions around it. But even until this week, Thursday is the bulk of the regional banks and some of those banks, East West Bank Corp, uh, potentially Zions that day. These are companies, John, that have outsized real estate, commercial real estate exposure relative to their outstanding loan base. So a lot of questions that we've been wondering about this economy won't be answered until later this week. But earlier in this week, we'll get some answers about just how much Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley have picked up some game in the middle of this deposit rush over to the bigger banks with the wealthier Looking clients. forward to your coverage with us. Shanali Basak there leading the coverage here at Bloomberg TV on some of the major lenders and the regional banks as well. We know the major banks doing fantastically. We saw that from JP on Friday alongside Wales and City. A number of analysts raising their price targets on JP Morgan following those results. The team over at Bank of America writing this. While it's easy to discount JPM's strong performance as merely benefiting from the deposit flight at regional banks, this view misses the extremely strong execution at the top. We raise our price target to 158 a share. B of A taking JP Morgan price target to 158 a share. That's the latest on some of the banks. Let's turn to pharma. Merck and Prometheus striking a $10.8 billion deal in one of the largest pharma acquisitions in recent history. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. And yeah, and take a look at the shares of Prometheus. Uh, Biosciences bio is up nearly 70%, a $114 stock. If you bought it Friday, now closer to $200. For a company that doesn't have any approved drugs, not so bad for those investors. But what they do have is a strong pipeline of autoimmune drugs. And that's what Merck wants. They want to 
diversify. So they are paying that $10.8 billion, 75% premium to Friday's close. It really diversifies them away from their traditional focus on oncology and especially Keytruda. Keytruda in 2024 is estimated to be about 43% of their revenue pie. The next biggest slice of their revenue pie, if you will, is 36% going to more than a dozen drugs. So they really have so much dependence on Keytruda. So if some of those autoimmune drugs uh, of uh, by the of um, Prometheus Biosciences are approved as is anticipated, it could really help them to, uh, again, soften the dependence on Keytruda. They, of course, did over the last year also acquire Sharing Plow, so they're aware of this issue. Uh, that was a $47.1 billion acquisition. CGen by Pfizer was another one. But to your point, Prometheus, one of the biggest ones around. And then finally, because of Merck's awareness of this issue that they have, it could be one reason, John, that these shares really outperforming over the last year, up 34% relative to the overall sector about flat and the S&P 500 down. So they're really managing that dependence risk well at this point. Abby, thanks for that. That's the latest on pharma. Let's get to tech. It's Bing versus Google. You know this. The AI-driven search wars heating up. The New York Times reporting Microsoft's Bing could replace Google as Samsung's default search service. Shares of Alphabet falling on the back of the report. Ed Ludlow has more. Hey, Ed. Yeah, that 3% decline in Alphabet, the parent of Google, puts it on track for its biggest drop since early February. The New York Times reporting that about $3 billion of sales are at stake. What we're talking about is the Google search app installed, pre-installed, into Samsung devices. Remember that Samsung shipped 261 million units globally last year. In many cases, Samsung handsets come pre-installed with both uh, Alphabet or Google apps and Microsoft apps. And so the consideration here is Bing being offered as the primary choice for search. Uh, you see the market's reaction. Remember that search accounts for 57 percent of Google's or Alphabet's revenue all told across all uh, types of search. It's a market that Google takes more than 90% market sharing globally. This is a very specific example and use case that the New York Times uh, is reporting on. Uh, and it's all about AI, right? The lure of Microsoft Bing is that it's now got the OpenAI chat GPT functionality integrated into it. So interesting to see uh, Google did not comment on the story or the report, John. Android. Ed, can I just sit on Android just briefly? Does yeah. that change the relationship between Samsung and Android at all? I think this is the question posed uh, by uh, the, the article the New York Times put out, right? If those 261 million units shipped last year uh, from Samsung, they all run on Android. And as I said, it's completely common for the Android platform to have pre-installed both Google applications and Microsoft applications. It's certainly a question that I would ask if I were able to put it to Google, um, what happens next in that relationship. But I think, you know, the common consensus among analysts is that you don't just change your operating system overnight, John. Google, struggling this morning. Ed, thank you, sir. And I agree with you. It's not something that shifts overnight, but you wonder how it will shift in the weeks, months, quarters, years to come. Here's the broader story right now for the equity market. Nine minutes into the session, stocks are really not doing much, but there is a move to talk about in the bond market. Yields a little bit higher at the front end by five basis points on a two-year, let's call it 4.15. We've talked a lot about this tension between the market pricing cuts and the Fed signaling for this year at least anything but. Calvin C of BNP Paribas says this, if economic conditions worsen, we think the market can price in earlier and more rate cuts. Calvin, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Calvin, great to have you with us on the program, sir. So let's start with that line. Is that your base case, more cuts and earlier? Thanks for having me. Our base case is that the Fed is not going to be cutting rates this year. Our base case is that the cuts won't come until Q1 of next year. However, that being said, when we look at our quantitative data, in particular, looking at the re-steepening of the U.S. yield curve, looking at what the options markets are telling us, and looking at one of Powell's favorite indicators, the near-term forward spread, all of these quantitative indicators suggest to us that even though our base case is for no rate cuts this year, it doesn't preclude the markets from pricing in more and earlier rate cuts. In particular, what we think is very important is that the CPI number last week has opened the door for the markets to price in more. Specifically, we think there's an asymmetry around the data going forward, and that is 
with all this concern and caution around the regional banking issues, we think it will require a long string of strong data for the markets to price in a longer hiking cycle, but it'll only require a few more weak prints for the markets to push the Fed and price in even more cuts. So you describe an asymmetric situation then. So push that through the bond market. What's the call now for the front end of the yield curve from you and the team? Our biggest call is on the shape of the U.S. yield curve. We see a quite significant steepening in the curve driven by a rally in the front end. Specifically in twos, tens, we're looking at that to get back positive again by the end of the year. And we like the steepening trade because we think it could really benefit from two different scenarios. Either, as just mentioned, the data continue to worsen and the markets price in further rate cuts, in which case we get a bull steepening of the curve driven by a stronger rally in the two-year. Or we think it could also steepen in bear steepening environments as well. Specifically, despite inflation showing signs of core services topping out, it still remains very high. And the Fed themselves don't forecast inflation getting back down to target until 2025. So for us, we also see a scenario where if these regional banking issues are not nearly as bad and the Fed has acted very cautiously, that the markets could inject more inflation risk premium into the curve, in which case it hurts the 10-year significantly more than the two-year, in which case the 10-year sells off and we still steepen. So for us, because it's such an elegant trade where it can work in both bull and bear scenarios, yep. One of our strongest views still remains on that steeper curve. So, Calvin, you described two different scenarios that basically lead to the same thing, led by different ends of the curve. Let me ask you this question. Do they lead to the same thing in the FX market? We think it does. Specifically, as it relates to the U.S. dollar, steepening environments almost always tend to be dollar negative. And a large reason for that is because of how foreign investors hedge their assets in the United States. Specifically, foreign investors tend to own long-end assets in the United States, and they tend to roll hedges in the front end of the curve. So as the curve steepens, especially if it goes back into positive territory, it makes it such that foreign investors get to FX hedge their do dollar-dominated securities at a much more attractive level. And when that FX hedging comes in place, it means they're selling dollars, which leads to a weaker U.S. dollar. So to us, a steeper U.S. yield curve is just one of many reasons, including very rich valuation and including a rotation of flow away from the U.S. into the rest of the world. That leads us to believe that the dollar is in the very, very early stages, we think, of a structural weakening trend. Kevin, super thoughtful stuff. Let's do this again soon. Kevin C. there of BNP Paribas looking for both a steeper yield curve, steeper yield curve and a weaker Dollar. The bond market right now looks like something like this on a two-year of five basis points of 415, the 10-year of five basis points to 356. The curve pretty much unchanged, a negative 58 basis points. Coming up on this program, Speaker McCarthy at the Stock Exchange will catch up with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie down in Washington alongside Kelly Lights. That's next. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lise Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Larry Adams, CIO of Raymond James Private Client Group. That's at 2 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Well, with Wall Street, I want to be very straight and forward with them. We can't continue down the path that we are right now. The CBO says if nothing happens, the trust funds of the highway, Medicare, and Social Security, they're going to get cut based upon the president. He's cutting those programs. And the what president doesn't want to cut them in his budget, though. What the president is cutting them, because what happens is they go broke in the next two years because he increased spending by $5.9 trillion. You can't afford it. And I don't want to do that. I want to save them. Speaker McCarthy addressing the New York Stock Exchange at the top of the hour. The Republican leader expected to revive the debt limit debate and make his case for spending cuts. Elsewhere, G7 ministers gather in Japan. A senior U.S. State Department official saying the group is united on its message for China, telling reporters on a call, quote, we want to work with China in those areas where China is prepared to work with us. And we are certainly going to stand up against any coercion, any market manipulation, any efforts to change the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. 
Team coverage starts right now with Bloomberg San Marie mm -hmm. in Washington alongside Katie Lines. Now, Katie, let's start with Speaker McCarthy in New York City. What's the focus of this one? Well, his message to Wall Street, John, is going to be about a responsible debt limit increase, essentially that any increase in the cap needs to have spending cuts along with it. He actually, over the weekend in a preview, teased to his speech, likened it to Ronald Reagan speaking at the NICE back in 1985 about his economic plan. What is so interesting, though, is that the White House, encountering this in a statement this morning, pointed out that Reagan warned against debt limit brinkmanship. To quote the statement directly, they say there is one spot responsible solution to the debt limit, addressing it promptly without brinkmanship or hostage taking, as Republicans did three times in the last administration. And as Presidents Trump and Reagan argued in office, they go on to say that McCarthy is holding the full faith and credit of the United States hostage and that a speech isn't a plan. The plan is really the question here, John, because we do know after reporting last week that the House may be looking at bumping this out a year into 2024, so increasing it for one year only. But as far as those spending cuts, there is no concern census yet on what exactly those cuts should look like, what the blueprint is. And that is what we keep hearing from this White House. President Biden saying, if you want to talk about this, you need to bring me a plan first. AMH, you spoke to Speaker McCarthy in the last couple of weeks. What is the plan? Well, from the White House, they say, as Kaylee just mentioned, and Biden was asked this over the weekend in the middle of the night at 2.30 a.m. when he landed back in the United States. He said, of course, I'll sit down with the speaker but show me your budget. And what Speaker McCarthy is trying to do is really bring this to the forefront. This is really his opening salvo to the White House yet again to have another in-person meeting. And what he wants to show is he's able to keep his caucus together. He has to make sure that 218 Republicans, whether they are on the far right or moderate Republicans, are able to sign up to this plan. Of course, it's dead on arrival, as Greg Vallier says. No way is it getting to the Senate. But the fact is, is Speaker McCarthy is able to show that he has his Republican caucus all together on this, then they can go to the White House and say, it's going to be very difficult for you to try to infiltrate this with a clean spending cut because the House has approved this. Want to watch in about 10 minutes' time. Anne-Marie, Kelly Lines to the two of you, thank you. Another thing to watch through the week, not just the bank earnings, a whole host of Fed speak lined up before the blackout period of the Federal Reserve. Mike McKee back with us for a little bit more. Hey, Mike. Hey, John. Well, the question now is not really what they're going to do on May 3rd unless there's some weird news between now and then. It's what they're going to do after that that preoccupies the markets. We do have a lot of Fed speak this week. Not not all of it important. Some of it is on different topics. But look out Wednesday for the Beige Book, Austin Goolsby and John Williams from the New York Fed. Loretta Mester, uh, Rafael Bostic and Pat Harker speaking Thursday. Those are going to be key days because then we get very close to getting into the blackout period and we won't have any guidance from anybody else at the Fed. And guidance is something it looks like the market needs. Take a look at this is the, dis, the January 2024 uh, Fed funds futures yield and it is uh, you might say rather volatile. They can't figure out where they're going uh, with this, where the Fed is going, even though the Fed keeps telling them the same thing. Interesting debate over the weekend, by the way, on Twitter, uh, for those of you who want to go back and look at it, Paul Krugman and Austin Goolsby, along with Ivan Werner, a, uh, a prominent economist, talking about whether wages actually predict inflation or not. Krugman suggesting that if you take out, if you use something like the uh, Cleveland Fed trim mean or something and look at uh, the Atlanta Fed business expectations index, you can get an idea that inflation is starting to go down, where Goolsby says it's too soon to say that because people don't ask for wage increases until they see prices going up. So uh, if uh, the intelligentsia is not uh, united on this, you can imagine the Fed is not. So a lot of uh, thinking about what's going to happen yet to come. Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Tons of Fed speak this week. I keep saying this this morning. It's a quiet start to an otherwise very busy week. Your broader equity market is basically unchanged on the S&P 500. Some churn beneath the surface with the sector price action. Here's Abby. There certainly is, John. It's pretty interesting for such a flat surface. We have one sector up more than 1%, one down more than 1%. Real estate is the best sector. Interesting also because yields are higher. So typically, this sector would not benefit given the fact that dividends uh, are important and they go higher uh, or they look more attractive when yields are lower. Communication services being dragged on by Google 
down 1.4 percent. If we take a look at the banks, which we've been looking at all morning, it's really interesting because the XLF and overall bank uh, ETF, well, it's now slightly higher. But what I wanted to highlight, take a look at State Street, the custody bank, down 14.5 percent. Their results simply missed right across the board. Schwab turning it back around despite their deposit issues. And then JP Morgan Chase adding to Friday's big gains, John. Thank you. Abby, thanks for that. The big banks reporting later this week. Bank of America, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, then a whole host of regionals will break down for you through the week. Up next on the program, your trading diary. Five minutes into the session, equities positive, just about a tenth of one percent on the S&P 500, down just about a tenth of one percent on the Nasdaq 100. Pretty snoozy stuff so far. That's the price action. Let's get you the trading diary. Coming up, Speaker McCarthy addressing the New York Stock Exchange at the top of the hour. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin speaking at noon Eastern. Big bank earnings continue Tuesday with Bank of America and Goldman. Morgan Stanley reports on Wednesday. Plus, we get the Fed's base book too. Another round of jobless claims coming on Thursday and more Fed speak. From Waller, Mester, Bauman, Boster, Harker. Before the quiet period, we round out the week with US PMIs on Friday. From New York City, that does it for me. Great to be back here in the heart of global markets in New York. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.